Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and today I'm joined by translator and recovering academic Brian Holton to talk about his latest book Hard Roads and Cold Hairst Winds which is out now published by Taproot Press. Hello Brian. Yeah. Right. And we're going to talk about the book and your life as a translator and many, many things, but I thought it might be quite nice for people to hear an example of the translation of the poetry, if you don't mind. Okay, fine. I mean, we'll start with a couple of quickies. Um, Yin Fu Li Bai, uh, which I can find in a second. This is a, a poem that was actually made famous by Ezra Pound. And it's a wee thing. It's just, it's just 20 syllables. Uh, it's a tiny wee thing. Uh, of course, I need mere syllables because... Um, uh, but what I try and do is, uh, for a five-syllable line like this, which goes one, two, pause, one, two, three, and then I do two stresses and three stresses. And I don't count the unstressed syllable. I didn't invent that, you know, but yeah. it, gives a, it gives a bit of punch to the line. This is by Lee... Well... I'll a bit explain something. Li Bai, Li is his surname, Bai is his own personal name, um, but it used to have what they called a reading pronunciation. The polite way to refer to him was Bo, Li Bo, which is why you, you see things like P-O and B-O. Mm -hmm. uh, I once heard a Radio 3 announcer uh, telling us we're going to hear some poetry by Lai Po. Lai Po. No, 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 no. Um, but after the 49, the communists decided that the reading pronunciation was feudal and therefore it stopped. So they rather vulgarly called him Lee Bai, but that's stuck nowadays. Right. Rather than Lee Boy, it's Lee Bai. Okay. And this was, as I say, Pound made this famous, but I thought I'd have a shot at it. It's called Dual Steppy Stairs Main. White, dew, wheat, and dual steppy stairs. Langs the nicht, her silken hose platching. Yen's mare, she lets down the crystal hangers, and through their blintering, keeks at the hearst moon. Yeah. It's just like it's like a wee thumbnail, isn't it? You know, it's just there's a there's one school, uh, one of my favourite writers, a 17th century um, editor called Jean Shang Tan. Uh, that's a the, the, Shang Tan was a by name he took. And it means the sage side, which is the shortest verse in, in, in Confucius. It appears yeah. twice for the sage size. Uh, and that's rather like a punk calling himself Jesus wept. You know, this, this guy was a rule breaker. He, was, right. he said, OK, there are two couplets, but actually there's a third. And it's the reader writes it. That's so that, you know, each of these leaves, it lingers you know, like good tea. And here's one from Du Fu. Normally they're paired as Li Bai is the jolly chap and Du Fu is, uh, is the voice of misery. Eh, Chinese love their yin-yang pairs, you know. Yeah. They, were, they were friends, so they didn't meet often, but uh, a lot of Li Bai's poems are like sad wee jokes. This is a wee bit longer. This is called A New Wheel Neggy. His old neg was New Wheel again. I've ridden you a rich good while now, in cauldriff weather o'er the border marches. Though steevely you'd rassle through the stour, you're weirin doon, and I'm heart sair that you're sick. You're sick, rather. Your births, your banes, I kenna who they hang together. You were dus and canny, aye, fi then to this. A patient fi thing ye are, though your will was nae small. I'm that great hearted new. I'll not can sing no more. Yeah, lovely. Like a wee sad joke, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and let me go back to Lee Bai again. Um, you like the border, the six songs of the border. I did, yes. Aye. Well, let's do the first and the last of them. Just the Reader's Digest version. Eh? Um, in this time, 8th century, you know, there was a point until about 750 where for about 150, 200 years, they felt, China felt they'd got it right. 
land, the land was peaceful, uh, officials were honest, um, there were good harvests, and in the pro as the proverb says, if you drop something on the street, you'd be there the next morning, and you didn't lock your doors at night. They thought they'd cracked it, and then it all went horribly wrong, um, which in itself is a story, and it, and it sort of destroyed the life of Dufu. Um, Lee Bai didn't affect so much because he had an independent income. He was never a Mandarin, and he was a wanderer, you know, so he was a bit independent. But there, it also led to Tibetan invasions. Before the Tibetans discovered Buddhism, they were very, very aggressive, you know. So this is the, the context, the songs of the border. It was a disputed border. In the fifth month, snow on the heavenly hills, nay flowers, this chittering cold. I hear on a flute the song of Nippet Sochs. Oh, I should have explained that. Nippet Sochs. When you were parting from somebody, you would break off a willow twig, break it in half, and each, the one leaving, the one staying, would each take a half. Yeah. And there's a reference later on to golden, golden bells. Well, instead, uh, you know, they used drums, they used bells and gongs instead of trumpets for marshalling armies. And so, in the fifth month, Nice, in the fifth, I'll start that again. In the fifth month, snow in the heavenly hills, nay flowers, this chittering cold. I hear on a flute the song in nippet socks, but where them colours I haven't seen yet. In the dawn, the fecht full as the gowden bells, at nicht who sleep curried into fantoosh saddles. I want to tack the long sword at my middle, to face and front, then heed in half the Utland Khan. And the last one. Bale fires shack the desert wastes. In a line they left the cludes of in sweet springs. China's emperor stands up, sword in hand, and gives his mandment to the fleeing general. Marshal Smedham fills the very left. The sooner drums is heard done by the rigs. They scalp on unhindered, brawl with courage bold. Come yins to grips. An ill day in warlockery is dicted to war. Ah, oh, lovely. Yeah. We hope. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's a great <laughs> taste of what's in the book, Hard Roads and Call Hair's Wind. And you mm -hmm. gave us a little bit of insight into it uh, by telling us a little biography of the two poets that you're translating. But perhaps it would be an idea to give more, say a bit more about who they are and why you chose to translate them. OK, the, first, the second one is easy to answer because these are the two big names. They're the two great poets in China. Yeah. You know, it, it's like they're, they're of a stature like Shakespeare. Um, they're just the, the ones. Um, and they did, I mean, they took a form called regulated verse where all the lines are the same length, either five or seven syllables. And it was used just for sort of a bit more than birthday cards, but like occasional verse in aristocratic circles. And as Shakespeare and his contemporaries did with the Italian sonnet, they made it into something really that was almost symphonic, something that was to do much, much more than it had been done before. So they changed the face of things. Um, Li Bai was possibly of Turkic origin. His parents were um, Silk Road merchants, as far as we can tell. We don't really know an awful lot about um, his background, but he gives a couple of hints in the poetry. And uh, he was a great, he was a wanderer, great traveler. To so say he never took civil service, he never took the civil service exams, he never became a Mandarin. But what he did do and took extraordinarily seriously is that he studied often for years on end with the great Taoist masters. Right. So, and this was the kind of Taoism that was about um, self-purification, living not immortal, but living a long life. And uh, there was alchemy involved and all sorts of things. So he's that side. And there's another pair that the Chinese love, is if you've got a Taoist in one hand, the other hand has to be Confucian. You know, they say that um, in, in Imperial China, people were uh, Buddhists for weddings and funerals and high days and holidays. They were Taoists on the day off, you know, go with the flow, sit in the country, don't do much, have a drink. And Confucians in the office, social conscience. Ah. 
So Du Fu is paired as the, as the Confucian one. And of course he was a Mandarin, but he was, he, he was a distant relative of the imperial family, a poor relation. And he was forgotten of, because of the chaos of, of civil war and uprisings and t Tibetan invasions. He was once posted to the far west to China and forgotten about for three years, you know. So, and it caused terrible hardship. Mandarins never served in their home province. They were rotated every three years to stop corruption. But his salary should have been paid to his family, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of his sons died of hunger. I mean, he, he had a hard, hard life, this man. Um, so his, he, he tends to be, well, I tell you, I can't remember if it's in this, I think it's in this book. I'd been doing Du Fu for a while. Um, I'd always liked him. And I'd intended uh, to work my way up. By 2017, I started, I, I had enough of Dufu to think, well, I can maybe get a book. And I got halfway to a book when the lockdown came. Oh, and I just yeah. finished the Yang Lien book, you know, I can translate I've got 20 books nearly of Yang Lien, but I, I just finished another and I wanted something else. So I went back to Dufu, but in the beginning of lockdown, his wonderful melancholy was just, it was too much. Uh, it was just too much for me. I couldn't. Be. And at that point, I was invited to look at a project which never happened of doing, uh, of, of translating Li Bai. So I started reading him again. And I just thought, oh, that's the voice. Oh, let's have a drink, boys. Let's have some fun, for God's sake, you know. So yeah. they're a matched pair for, you know, I mean, Dufu can be funny too. And, and Li Bai can be melancholy. But generally, you know, they're, they're a sort of matched pair. But Levi uh, preferred a kind of more fluid, folky form, if you like. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Dufu, went, he, could, he could write in the modern style, the, the regulated verse, but Dufu preferred that. He rose to heights never seen before. You know, I compare him, his, 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 his stuff to, um, you know, uh, a, a late Beethoven quartet, you know, or to some of the later Shakespeare, you know, the, the depth and the complexity in it. It's yeah. just astonishing. So, but it's like something lost in translation. Well, that's a, a lovely way to ask the question, how did you become a translator? I mean, I believe the only translator, published translator at the moment, Chinese into Scots, is that? Well, the only one in captivity, as far as I can. Yes, know. well, there you are, a rare sighting we have. <laughs> but how did you, how did you become a translator? How did you get into to doing this? Well, I mean, my, Briefly, I grew up in, uh, my, I was born in Galley, but uh, my parents were living in West Africa. My dad had spent the war in North and East Africa. He spoke Swahili. Uh, he was educated in French. He was bilingual, he was Irish, bilingual in French. And of course he had Latin and Greek as well. Um, and he learned Swahili in Tanganyika. And then they were working in Nigeria and in the North before we were born, he, he lived, how he spoke Hausa. Then we moved South to Lagos. So fine. My granny's house was full of stuff from China and Japan yeah. because my mother's, two of my mother's uncles, two of my great uncles were engineers on the big ships that sailed with the Ben Link, the Far East. So, and oh, this must've been something to talk about when they first met because uh, my grandfather on the other side and his brother were both engineers on the Ben Link. Yeah. So, although there wasn't that much stuff in the house. So our house was full of African stuff. My granny's house full of Far Eastern stuff. And then at school, I was, I discovered a talent. I was doing Latin and French and then Greek. And um, I was reading poetry in every language. I was crazy for poetry as a teenager. And I suddenly found in the school library a volume of Arthur Whaley's translations of Chinese poetry. And it struck me like a thunderbolt. It had never occurred to me that I knew Chinese people painted and made furniture and, you know, uh, but it never occurred to me that they wrote poetry. And I thought, ooh. And then a wee while after that, um, uh, I'd done my hires and I was doing, uh, thinking about uh, what I would do at university. And Edinburgh opened a Chinese department. And I thought, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Against the advice of most of my family and half of my teachers. But I did. Uh, I, I didn't make a go at it. Uh, the, the first shot, I was just out young and I had to leave. And I, but I, I went away and I got married and I stepped back and I, and I did it. And, uh, in these days, 
they were trying in the 70s to, to use the new communicative methods of learning languages, but mostly it was the same as we had learned Latin and Greek, it was grammar and translation, you know, you'd go line by line in the text, you know, construe boy, and uh, so that was what I knew, and um, by the time I was in my late 20s, I'd fallen in love when I was an undergraduate with the great novel Shui Hu Duan, known as, um, what's it called in English? The Water Margin. Oh, yes, yes. If you remember uh, the incompetent Japanese TV series, if I, you're old enough. I remember, yes. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's a novel about bandits. And it, it, at its heart, again, it, this was edited by the guy I mentioned before, Jin Shang Tan, the Jesus Web guy. Um, and he pared it down to a single question, what does a good man do about bad government? And each of the heroes are a different response. The bad guys collaborate, but you know, how do you? And of course, my mother's family are off of the borders. Apparently, there was a family tree that was lost in a fire in the thirties, but my mother saw it. And she remembers, you know, remember Young's being justified at Jethard for cattle stealing and stuff like that. Right. So, and these guys in the novel, you know, they have by names like the Reavers, you know, F.J. Yeah. Fire the Braves and Doug Pintle Elliot. They have names like that. And I thought, that's great. And I tried to translate it, but I couldn't make it work. And then my first wife, we were staying across the water in Ganton Sound, and I was telling her about this. And she said, listen, you spent the last years reading everything you find in Scots. Why not do it in Scots? I said, well, I've never written in Scots. But I tried, and the first chapter just fell off the page. I thought, my God, I've got something here. And I sent the drafts up to my teachers, to um, Bill Dolby and John Scott, the blessed memory in Edinburgh. And Bill was so excited, he went next door to the, the St. Crastus office. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Murray said, yep, yeah, we're having that. He wanted to serialise it. So that was me off. Fantastic. <laughs> I mean, for those who St. Crastus was a literary, Scots literary magazine at the time that was based in Edinburgh. What a great thing to have them literally take it from your hand and say that's going to be published. And it was just the first typewritten draft as well. It was the finished article. Um, but the, the editor changed after a, a, like a year and a half and the next editor wanted to put his on, so he didn't. But then uh, Peter Kravitz took it at, uh, and Murdo MacDonald took it at uh, the Edinburgh Review. So, you know, I managed to publish about, I always wanted to do the 70 chapter version. I think I've, I finished seven chapters and published maybe mm -hmm. five. Um, I could not get a publisher, yeah. you know, a five volume novel in Scots, they went, oh yeah, and I was told there's no market for Scots, and then 1983, the Lorimer New Testament came out, went through, what was it, four editions in, in three months, but no, no, there's no market, so I've never managed to sell that, so I went to poetry because it's quicker and easier to do. And then when I went into universities, you know, it's, it's easy to knock off a, tra a poem and a draft in an afternoon. Much more difficult to knock off a chapter in an afternoon. Yeah, so, you know. I mean, is that one of the reasons that it's more common to get translated poetry than full translated novels in Scots or in English? You know, it does seem to me it's more likely to be in poetry. Aye. Well, I mean, after... Well, you can out start it. In 1560, the Reformation Parliament, there wasn't enough printers to make Bibles in Scots, and then there wasn't a translation, so they imported the Wycliffe Bible. And that uh, meant that English became the language of prose, eventually. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I used to know a chap who, um, whose speciality, his PhD, was in uh, Broxburghshire Farmer's Diaries. And some of them were writing in broad Scots right up to the Victorian period, you know. Um, it didn't it, 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 it became less public, which is maybe connected to the fact that now we're talking about cyber Scots, the informal media encourage folk to use their own tongue. Yeah. Formal media, because I mean, let's face it, very few of us in Scotland were educated in Scots, we're awesome. essentially illiterate in Scots yeah. because we're, we're reading right in English. But um, if it's informal, as it is in, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, my, uh, blah, blah, new media. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we may see a revival yet. We never yeah, stopped I singing. I think there may be something, a revival, uh, you know, uh, happening uh, uh, at the moment, not at perhaps the pace 
there could be, but it is interesting that there are now novels being written in Scots that are winning awards, you know, for, for being written in Scots as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the things kind of are changing. But you, you know, you have translated in English as well as Scots. Right. But you mm -hmm. felt Scots was right for this collection. Was it for the reasons you said that, you know, it was, it just felt the right thing to do? In your afterward, you go into kind of some detail about why you thought Scots was the right language. Maybe you could explain that a little bit. Well, there's something in, I mean, I didn't entirely go along with Edmund, Edwin Muir's notion that Scots, uh, for Scottish folk, English is the language of the heed and Scots the heart. But there's something in that. It's my mother, it's my mother tongue, you know? Yeah. And it speaks to me awfully deeply. But more importantly, there's fewer rules in Scots. So I can break rules, I can invent rules, I can make up words. Yeah. I'm sorry to shock you, but why else I make up words? <laughs> but, you know, it gives me a freedom. And, and I find, I don't care if it's me or the tongue itself, but there's a muscularity in Scots that I, I can't get in English. You know, there's, there's something there. And like I say in the, in the afterward, it's, it's a bit like uh, using uh, authentic instruments for Baroque music. When you hear recorders and vials, there's an innocence to them. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of innocence to Scots in that way as well. And also, I mean, I started when I was doing the watermarks and the moss flower, I cried it. My feeling was if it can, if Scots can do this, what can it no do? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I was wanting to lay my chucky stain on a bit, on a, on a muckle cairn. Yeah. I was, uh, I, I was, I'd, I'd read the Mackers, I'd read Scott and Stevenson and all the rest of it, you know, in the Border Ballads. And I thought, well, I'd like to put my wee chucky stain on that. And so far, I'm still finding out, I'm still stretching the envelope of Scots. It yeah. can do anything I've asked it to. Because, you know, it's an old language, it's an old, it's as old as English, it's no deed yet for, you know, for a good job. Um, so, yeah, that's, there may be a political issue here as well, but we'll see. It's that. interesting for me reading them because it did kind of, your transitions, Times did remind me of the, the markers, as you said, Dunbar and Henderson, um, that kind of medieval Scots where, um, it, which kind of got lost to a lot of us because, as you say, you know, we weren't educated in, mm. in that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but then reading it afterward, I thought, no, it's more complex than that. There is also taking on Burns and Scott himself and other people as well. What, what I would say is I'm, I'm trying to write not McDermott's synthetic Scots, but literary Scots. Um, now, I'm not trying to write middle Scots. No. Couldn't no. do that. And there, I mean, there is an issue, though, of um, anachronism. Now, these guys were writing in the 8th century. So yeah. should I write 8th century? Should I write like Beowulf? Yeah. You know, but the, 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 the counterweight to that is when these guys were writing, it was brand spanking new. You know, so I have to make it sound new as well. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of boys to keep in the air here. Yeah. Well, it's like a, a, you're, you're taking the history of the language, Scots that is, and using everything that's included in that history. Yes. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was it Oscar Wilde that said talent creates, genius steals? Yes. You know. I mean, I'm no, I'm like McDermott, you know, I'm no blade at uh, nicking stuff. I'll chew, I'll chew a word for anywhere. I try and no use words that I've never used myself. Uh -huh. So that, I mean, the stuff, if it's for Shetland or, or, uh, or the Doric, then, you know, I'll know maybe squeeze that in, but that, that gives us plenty, you know. Oh, there's that plenty, Border, yeah. But I just have to keep my window open in the summer here to hear great broad border Scots. Yeah. Just, you know, it's no, it's no deed my long chalk. That's the other thing, you know. But you. I did get me thinking about the history of Scots and how it, due to kind of education <laughs> and, as you say, the, 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 the taking on of um, the English version of a Bible and what, what many people might be the only book in the house, it was, it's a kind of broke, it's a broken history, isn't it? And I do wonder if, you know, there is now a, a desire to read books like yours and others in the language that, as you say, people open their window, they either here in their own house or here outside their front door. 
I think the tradition was never broken. Uh, in Burns's time, along with the Bible, you would find Barber's Bruce. Yeah. You know, so that that was, I mean, whilst it was in Alan Ramsey's kind of English tradition, but, you know, nonetheless, um, it wasn't entirely English. Was it Ramsey? Whoever. Um, so, I mean, it, it never broke entirely, but there was a concerted attempt to break it. You know, the, the quaintly titled Scottish Education Department was set up to extirpate Gaelic and Scots, mm -hmm. you know, and turn us all into English speakers. Unfortunately, that didn't work. Yeah. You know, I'm delighted to say. Uh, but there's also, there's a hidden stream, isn't there? Yeah. There's the, the public and official face of a language. And then there's the way that people actually use it. And they know the same thing. And I'm trying to dip into base, really. And again, I wonder if it's why the translation of poetry, which is often a spoken form as well as a written form, is so appealing. Whereas um, for a long time, you didn't tend to, even Scottish novels were, were, it might have some Scots phrases in it, but it wasn't really written in Scots. And I do think that is something that is slowly changing. Well, of course, Walter Scott, set another borderer, he set that pattern where the, the narrator speaks English and the characters speak Scots. And that just kind of took off, you know. Uh, you, and if you think of Galt and, and Hogg, you know, the rest of them, they took that on. And of course, uh, as a commercial decision, it maybe wasn't a bad you know, because, you know, the English language market is bigger. There's no doubt about oh, that. Scott, anyway, didn't it? He sold a few books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, he's just doing the road, you know. Ah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because you are in a kind of heartland of Scottish literature, haven't you? I mean, the, the Borders really has such a vibrant uh, history Aye. there. And that is clearly something, I think, reading the book that you're feeding off as well. It's in your bones, as they say. <laughs> well, and yet the odd thing was, I mean, when we came back from Nigeria, we went to Edinburgh and then we stayed in Stirlingshire in, in and around Falkirk. And I came back for third year to Gala Academy. So that means I missed the Walter Scott that was stuffed in Border Bairns through primary school and, and the first couple of years. I'd never read Marmion or The Lady of the Lake, you know. I'd, uh, I think I'd probably read the classics comic version of Ivanhoe, but that was a hack end of it, Scott. So I had a wee bit of catching up today when I came here, you know. Uh, but last year, the, the, lock, the first lockdown, uh, I sat down just to read my way through Scott. And, you know, I love what uh, Stevenson said about him, that he, um, he was a great storyteller and he loved to listen to a story and he loved to write the kind of stories he loved to hear. But of the craft of novel writing, he knew nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's... I often think what a modern day editor would do say to Walter. Oh, well, when you're reading them in extenso, you know, there's, there's a good few whales you want to give him a shog and say, get on with it, would he? You know, I mean, his sermons about maidenly virtue, I'm like, come on, just, just get on with it, get on with the story. Yeah. Uh, because when you get into the story, he gallops along, you know. Yeah. And yeah, of course, that's, uh, that, uh, it's the heartland here, really, in, in, in many respects. I mean, uh, I was once in company with a Glasgow, uh, some of my pals, and a Glasgow man said, ah, but you're half English in here. And my pal, a local man, he turned around and says, listen, you'd be English if, if it was, you'd be English if it wasn't for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. And sometimes, you, you know, it's never, these kind of things I've never felt more strongly than they are at the, the border. That's right. Back to that's right. Yeah. And of course, I mean, like any border, the folk on either side are liker each other than they are their further neighbours. So, you know, when I go into Northumberland, and the tunes, uh, you know, we share tunes and songs. They're just, uh, it, in a, I say this to some uh, people from Jordistan, and I say, well, really, this is just Southern Scots. They say, no, what you speak is North Northumbrian. <laughs> It's an argument yeah, that'll never end. The way that language kind of moves through areas is really very interesting. You know, there, there's, there's words I hear um, from writers and from for kind of the Newcastle area that mm. you'll hear in Irvin Welsh's books, but you wouldn't hear in Jim Kelman's books, you know, because that exactly. is exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I spent quite a lot. I taught in Durham and Newcastle, so I spent a lot of time around there, and I just loved it, you know. When you hear the right broad Geordie, you know, I was gone doing the road, you know, I was gone him, 
well, my granny used to go and gym. Right. You know, although you didn't hear that palatalization so much, uh, you hardly ever hear it anywhere. But you still get, you know, the, I go down to Langham, I've got a couple of pals there, they play the pipes, board their pipes. And, uh, you know, oh, Langham still does the yow in May. Yeah. Oh, we'll hit his eye again. <laughs> my my mum is from Annan, and that's exactly, she's the same thing, that kind of yow man, exactly. and, that, you know, which she that's wasn't right. allowed to speak in the house. She would have got a rap across the knuckles for that. Yeah, in, 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 border, in border towns, that was called mill talk. None of your mill talk at the table. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, it's it's got exactly what you're saying that it was seen to be somehow lesser, despised and rejected. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, there's this thing. You know, I mean, when I, when I was, uh, you know, in the, the back end of the seventies and eighties, reading Edinburgh Review and St. Crastus, we were all reading Franz Fanon mm -hmm. on inferiorism and and Gramsci. You know, mm -hmm. they, these were big and and Ngugi Wationgo was another one. These were big influences on me. You know, Ngugi Wationgo uh, gave up writing in English and went uh, and started and went back to writing in Kikuyu. And his reasons for that is a book called Decolonizing the Mind. These were very important for me. This is a theoretical underpinnings for me to the day by day. Um, and I've forgotten what you said. Well, we were just talking about um, a language being suppressed or at least yeah. even denied yeah. by your own people, you know, by saying, oh, no, that's right. a lesser yeah. language. The language of the playground or the pub is lesser. The gutter. The gutter. Yeah, in yeah. the 1980s, um, Professor Aitken, who was the editor of the Dictionary of the Older Scottish Tongue, he wrote an, an article called Bad Scots. You know, Gid Scots in the country, Bad Scots in the tune. Mm -hmm. uh, my granny spoke Gid Scots, but the Bairns speak the language of the gutter. And he took it back to about 1570, if I mind right, before he ran out of materials. You know, that's been around a long time. But yeah. since, you know, the, the anglicisation, the kind of... Um, I've seen it described recently as a trison de clerc, you know, the treason of the, of the educated classes, the adoption of English and the consequent need to say that Scots was of no value. I mean, that's inferiorism. That's where you take uh, the governing classes or the colonizers' view of your culture and you swallow it whole and just mirror it back to them. Well, I'm, I've been fighting that. Yeah. I think this is just no the right thing at all. Um, so, I mean, yes, they are political. But the other thing that struck me reading it was, do you think that translation is a way to discover or understand other cultures better? And the thing I was thinking about was watching a film, a foreign film with subtitles, I always feel is a better way of doing it than a dubbed film or worse than that, a remade version. And I think Hi. translation seems to do something similar. It is. I mean, if you go back, if you can find the preface to the King James Bible, the translators there, I mean, they were good, these boys. The, the guy who wrote the preface said, translation it is which lifteth the curtain, which openeth the curtain and letteth in the light, that yeah. cracks the shell that we may eat the nut. Uh, it, it's far from being cultural appropriation. It's, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, translation is the bridge that, to reach into the heart. And when you're doing poetry, poetry is written not for some quick buck. Mm. It's written because it matters. Yeah. I mean, in China, we didn't, don't have this thing. I mean, Western poetry comes from two sources, the, the divinely inspired poet in Greece, the, or, you know, the God speaks through the poet, and the, the oracle. And then the prophet, Hebrew prophets, again, God speaking through... And this Wordsworth man speaking to other men wasn't the case in China. It was more intimate, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, some there are other genres. My next book coming out is twelfth in July is twelfth century song lyrics, and that's a different thing again. You know, they were intended to be sung. Yeah. These poems, some of them would have been sung, but mostly they were intended to be read. You know. Ah right. Read. Yeah. And of course, that gives you another thing, which I'm rambling a little bit. There's a, the, the, something that I cannot translate is, you know, the absolute beauty of the Chinese script. Yes, yes. And you can play graphic games with it. Mm -hmm. 
there's um no it's not on the back page oh yes you know it's not but there's one element the character is the three drops of water dot dot tick yeah. and there's a famous tang dynasty poem a bit later than these these guys that has a chilly damp feeling about it it's miserable and it never mentions chilly or damp but it just uses a lot of characters with that element so you get a visual a graphic element giving you a kind of semantic or emotional underpinning to the poem. You can't even do that in an alphabetic language. Yeah, it's almost a kind of concrete poetry where there's visualization is, is feeding into yes. the poetry itself. I and mean, you should yeah, yeah, say yeah. that in the book, and I'm holding it up to the camera here, there are the kind of calligraphy and the Chinese versions on every, of every yeah. single one. And there's, you know, the, the beautiful calligraphy. Um, yeah. oh, he's he credited as Chi Jiang, but you know, that's reversing the order of his name. His his name is Jiang Chi. Mm -hmm. He is a he's the guy who did the cover yeah. painting of Arthur's Seat. If there's a if there's ever a follow up, I'll get him to do the Yielding Hills instead. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that that is just gorgeous calligraphy, yeah. and that's not something that we really have anymore. Yes. You know, if you go back to uh, copper plate or, or, you know, early modern secretary hand and stuff, you can look at a hand and say, that is beautiful. And it influences the way you read. Yes. But we've, we've kind of lost that, or what little we had of it. You know? Yeah. Right, would you like another poem? Yes, that would be lovely. I think that would be a perfect time to have another poem. <laughs> right. Uh, miserable or cheery? Let's go cheery. Let's go cheery. How no? How no? Um, I've got plenty, plenty, plenty. Lines on the Tassie wine for us. This is Lee Bai. The spring wind blows for Easter war, then on a sudden day it's gain. Fine colour wine in a gowd and Tassie. It's clicking wee wee pills. Must have been champagne. Bunny lassies getting foo, cheeks leaping red, peaches and plumes in Ben green palings. Who's there some money of them? The Lincoln licht whommels a body, but it's dwint and gaining a blink. Sir, get you up and dance. The sun's setting west of all. There's the years you didn't want to scale. There's the years you didn't want to scale. All your will and smed him. Your white hair's like the silk, but what gids mac and nern for it? Uh, and the second, the, the comparison to that one, uh, sorry, the companion to that, the second part, a classic but eminent plane tree to play on, come for the dragon yet. Good wine and a jug of jade, say fine it looks tim. I'll tiddle the strings and temper the pins and drink with you again, sir, till I see your bruny blear and your cheek beel reed. Don Norlin Limmer's face is bony as a flower. I hint the bar, she's smiling like a breeze in spring. Smiling like a breeze in, string, in spring, dancing in her flindrican goon. Good, sir, can you wear the word a drink now? Would you be going quiet like him? Fantastic. Brian, I think that is the perfect place to leave it. But thank you so much for joining me today and having a chat. It's been absolutely fascinating. It's been a joy. Thank you. I mean, I'll do this anytime, anywhere. I'll talk about what I do because um, I think it is important that you hear voices for different places. And it is important you hear things said in Scots that have never been said before. Yeah. You know, right. it's, it, it, it stretches your heart as it stretches mine when I'm reading and, and doing it, you know. And if you get half the fun out of this book that I had doing it, then it's worth the, it's worth the price. It, it certainly is, and I'm, I'm sure I know people will. And I should say it is out now with Taproot Press, so go and uh, pick up a copy. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. Mm -hmm.